Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. 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 You're all right over there? So first on our agenda, we're going to approve the minutes from 117.23. Second. All those in favor? Okay. Um, we are going to have some rearrangements. I guess we're, uh, okay. Okay. we're going to go number four. So citizen comments at this time. If we don't finish everything in this meeting from 5.30 to 6, we will be reconvening after the budget meeting, which will start at 6 o'clock. So we all know. So if you don't get through all of this, we will be done tonight. We'll just be done after. <coughs> all right. So no sense of comments. We're going to move on to presentation of school programs. Hi, everybody. I'd like to introduce to you Christina Campa. She's a landscape architect and also the parent of a fourth grade student. And Kristen Groves, our K-1 teacher. Um, Lauren Weider, she's here as well. We are all together, some of the members of the Jackson newly formed playground committee, or extended playground committee, because we've been talking about renewing this playground for many, many years now. And so um, we put together kind of a brief slideshow to talk to you about what we're thinking and hoping, and it will go along with a Warren article that will come up later in the budget discussion and um, we will go to the town hopefully um, in March. So um, would Christina and Kristen like to take over? Thank you both for being willing to come and do this for us. Yeah, I move. Discrete projects that can be phased in over time 
um, and establish the scope of the first phase of play areas within the context of a property-wide vision. This one takes a while to load. It will come. <laughs> um, so here is a um, image from, I don't know, the satellite. It's Google Earth. Google Earth. Um, and Christina overlaid some things with the image. Um, so you can see this here, the yellow is the existing play area. We would propose to move it a little bit um, out and change the shape of it a little bit. And then there's a smaller orange space here. Um, and this, oh, oh no, it's the long one to load. The smaller area would be um, for more of a sensory play area, something designed for um, younger children as well. Wait, before you move on. Yep. Sorry. So when and if we, uh, we do the changes to the school structure itself, I just want to make it clear, right? The playground area space here will not have to be moved. This takes into that consideration. That is yeah. correct. Okay. The movement takes into account um, things that have already been talked about, about changes to the existing footprint of the building that may or may not happen in the future. Great. Just while we have that. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. We are putting a warrant article for $75,000 on the, uh, whatever. Uh, the budget allows for replacing the existing central play and swing structures and adding new wood mulch surfacing, so replacing completely what we have here. It also creates a new play area that has structures in it. Um, it's focused on younger groups and is inclusive of students with special needs. Um, that would be closer to the blacktop area, and it also has the ability to be fenced in, so it's a fully enclosed space, which our space out here does not have the ability to do. Uh, the pricing for the equipment and servicing area was collected from playground manufacturers, so it is an estimate, but it is a good estimate based on professionals. Um, and pending and undetermined costs include updated survey, professional services, drainage work. Um, so what do we get for $75,000? Um, we don't get these pictures. <laughs> these are stock images. Um, but we put them in here to sort of show our vision a little bit. Um, we would be wanting to get a new multi-component structure that would accommodate up to 20 children. Um, we'd like to get a new swing set with at least four standard swings and one accessible swing. Um, how many kids are in the school? Like 50? If you ask the kids, we need 50 swings. But um, I think at least four is good. Um, then we would have play area two. And in that smaller play area, we would hope to have a spinning or moving component. We would like to have an accessible component. And we'd like to have a low climbing structure. We'd like to have the elements there be accessible for any kind of learner. Um, it would also give us new surfacing, engineering with fiber. Uh, rubber ball pads, accessible paths, um, and all of that is to be determined. Um, and it would also get us site preparation, structure installation, um, with the addition, or with the help of a community build. All right, I think this is where maybe I'll have you take over and talk a little bit more. You guys thought I was here to talk about design. I'm here to talk about the spreadsheet. Um, so, um, Typically, when I do uh, projects, whatever they may be, residential, institutional, and scope, is that we start with the scope of work that um, we're interested in doing, and then begin to piece together um, uh, cost elements. And there's always assumptions um, in some of these numbers, but the um, what I took here is took the play areas and grabbed the square footages of all the play areas. And then we grabbed, uh, we selected equi equipment, pieces of equipment from Play World. Um, and these are all, so all the equipment selections are listed there. We're estimating about 38,000 in equipment pieces. Um, that only makes up about 50% of the overall playground budget uh, when we talk about installation and site prep. Um, so these are estimates, it's not really accounting for things like, you know, uh, grants or fundraising or, you know, in-kind donations, anything like that. Um, 
But this is a, what I would consider a cost model and a, um, and a pretty solid one. And all, all the numbers have been verified. The uh, Play World representative has been very helpful to us. Um, so the um, process here, I think, is a two-pronged process. Um, we have our phase one uh, scope that we need to identify all of the pieces that are in that and how we're going to, um, in, uh, what the design is, but then also um, contacting contractors, permitting, all these other pieces. But the other part that I think is really important for the school to do is do what I call a vision plan. Um, you may have known this formally called, most people call it a master plan, but it's taking the entire property and looking at um, developing the entire property. Um, taking it on a conceptual level. So that as you move forward to doing any additional developments, you're thinking property-wide. Um, you're thinking about building um, development um, and any other kind of program development might happen on, on the site. Um, so it's just important to think about all of it. So uh, to your question is, you know, the building expansion, can this accommodate it? You know, is it, is it in keeping with uh, curriculum, curriculum development? Is it um, in keeping with growth um, in the school? So these are all the things that in a vision plan will begin to tap into, not just the, the I, big ideas like, oh, we want jungle gyms and trails and um, all these different element, components. There's a, there's a lot more to it. So we need to think big. Uh, and once we have that big vision, we will peel these things off and these can become discrete projects that can be fundraised for, um, uh, you could do in-house. Um, so it's just important to have a, a bigger vision. From that, it will help us define the scope. So in this, this spring, we're doing this now, the Warren article um, that will be loaded on uh, in March. Uh, uh, we'll kick off a, a vision plan that will engage the JGS community, that staff, parents, and students. Um, um, we'll begin to identify supporting <coughs> strategies that can help us with this. Um, uh, and then engage play equipment manufacturers, which has already, um, we've already started that process. Um, and this summer, hope to finalize it, finalize a vision plan, and identify phases. So that means identifying that phase one scope, what's really in it, what can we afford in that phase one. It may just, it may be the $75,000 base uh, playground equipment structure, but you know, we, we could get very creative here and more could happen. Um, and then in the fall is to uh, present that to the community, um, uh, verify the phases, and move that phase one project into schematic design. Um, and, and in that phase, you do your value engineering. Um, you, know, you get harder prices, more concrete prices. Um, <clears throat> And I think towards the end of this, we'll really begin to understand if we can do more than, than that initial phase. Um, it, once, by the, by the time fall ends, we really need to be um, moving into um, having constru uh, construction documentation and any permitting, any regulatory issues. We do have wetlands back here that we need to pay attention to. Um, so um, we're, we want to get all of that out of the way in the winter so that we can break ground um, in the spring, and that means ordering equipment. And you know. <laughs> So this this process, and this I also went over this um, with uh, the playground manufacturer, trying to understand how was their lead time in ordering equipment, um, how long does it take them to organize uh, a community build, if that's what they decide to do, um, which is a great way to think about installing the playground instead of having their team come up and do it, we do it. Um, they, as they assume all the liability, they manage the, uh, the installation, um, but it's a, he said for this scale, 15 people, two to three days, um, and we would get it in the ground, um, which I thought was really, really great. Um, um, so that, that puts us um, on track for spring, which you want the spring before June, right? <laughs> to, uh, I think you went summer and I changed it to spring. Yeah. <laughs> Compressed it a little bit, uh, but that's the general process, and I think that throughout the process we would be 
um, there will be certain milestones we need to check in um, with the community um, to make sure that we're, we're on the right track. I have just a quick question. Because this would be a warm article, all work would have to be done and things would have to be purchased by June 30th of 2024. I know that um, we run into issues with vendors being able to provide, for example, resurfacing the, the track of the high school. They're booking like a year and a half in advance. Because if, if a warrant article is passed, you have that entire year from July 1st to June 30th to expand that on the way this is written. Yeah, so just, just something yeah. to think about. Now I don't know what kind of the playground is, so I don't know what the lead time would be to purchase an order and get things done. Yeah, they're saying about 14, 14 weeks. Yeah, okay. Usually pre-pandemic it was eight weeks, but it's, it's about 14 weeks now. So that's right, we would take that, <laughs> that date and start backing up the schedule and understanding when we needed to order it, when we needed to get on contractor schedules um, in order to align everyone. Um, and then we will have a suggestion of doing it in the spring so that we can involve the students. I was also being mindful of the fact that the money would run out when I changed the system. Yeah. <laughs> Kristen, can you just, yeah. just so that you, um, for people who are not familiar with our playground, mm -hmm. sometimes 16 years may not seem like it's really old. So I know that we have discussed as a board, and Gail has discussed with us, and, and Mr. Stokey, all the commitments that have gone in to extend the life of the equipment that's outside so, of all of our elements. I think I should, maybe I should say that again. This playground was not installed 16 years ago. It was 16 years ago that we tried to get a new one. Um, which we means we installed this playground which, after an addition. They were, it had been taken apart and stored, and we put on the addition, and then it was reassembled in this location. So the groundwork was done um, while I was here, and we put the old, the old playground back up again. When the original playground was purchased, I really don't know, maybe I see Ian back there. Maybe you remember the year that that playground was purchased? Well, if I started in the year 2000, it was before that. <laughs> I've been here for 20 years, and the children have been playing on this. Yeah. So I just want to make it clear that so this 16 is not a nice years hat. ago, there were, it was a contingent at the school that felt like it was time to replace the playground. I did do some research online. This is not from one of the playground manufacturers. This is from a simple Google search, but it said eight to 10 years and with proper maintenance that life can be extended. Um, so we're, we're definitely at the end of the recommended lifespan. So we've seen good Yankees. So that swing set, was moved three times before it got to where it is, was here, I think for a long time, when I showed up in 1977. Um, so it's very, very old. Um, the structure play, play area, I think it was sometime in the mid 90s that we, that we put that up. And that's been moved at least once, I believe. And um, I was involved in moving them one of the times, and moving it really affects the integrity of it. So it's long, long past due that we replace the playground equipment. I didn't mean to harp on that, I just want to make it clear that we have done everything we can. Yes. We have gotten our money's worth. Oh, yes. Thank you.
one of the agenda items. Uh, there are some handouts up front if, if folks need those. One is entitled School Board and Community Relationships. And, and really, it can be a confusing, delicate process in, in the community. Ultimately, the school board, the administration want to partner with the community to provide the best education that they, they can for, um, for the students. So in this, this handout here, it talks about working together, but ultimately how we have to work together and respect that, that process going back and forth. So the school board, myself, administration, we follow RSAs, and we also follow the New Hampshire Department of Education education standards. Um, these are live links, and, and I can send it electronically with you as well. In addition to that, there are school board policies. And again, I, I apologize. <laughs> Yeah, I can send it to Susan, she can push this out and you'll be able to click on the, the links. But on the SEU website, if you go to Jackson School Board, um, and click under policies, there, there are a couple of policies that are there. In one policy, and I have several hard copies here, is, is KE public complaints. And, and it's, it's, it's a dance that we have to do in familiarity, right? So, the board, we're governed by following these policies and these laws and these rules. And sometimes if people aren't as familiar, it seems like it's an arbitrary, frustrating process to go through. So the purpose of this is to help everybody understand a little bit better on how to navigate through what can be a tricky situation. So under public complaints, it talks about going through teachers first, and then to the building principal, to the superintendent, and ultimately to the school board. And there's a, it kind of walks you through that process as well. And that's for general complaints and, and those type of things. There are other policies that are specific to materials in the school if you wanted to challenge those and how to go about doing that. Um, and then there's policy KEB, which talks about public complaints about school personnel, employees, students, or administrators. And it even goes through the same type of process. If it's a complaint about a staff member, then we go to the building principal, ultimately to me, and then eventually, depending upon what it is, we go to the school board. Um, if it's about me, <laughs> you go right to the school board. So line up if you'd like that. Would move to you. Um, so, so really, those are the rules, right? And then um, I included in here, there's a number of documents that we sit through with new school board members. And, and uh, there's, again, that's a live link. So if you want to take a look in school board association documents about training school board members, because they sometimes own restaurants or run businesses or rock climbers or whatever it happens to be. And this is a little bit of a, a different venue to, to practice those skills. And in a small community like this, I, that's why I bold, uh, bold type this, they are ultimately the judge and jury, right? They hire people, they fire people, they, they handle things. I make recommendations to these folks, but ultimately they are the decision makers. They, they, they take the recommendations, set policies, put budgets together. And as you say, because the school board may need to sit as judge and jury for these hearings, it's important that individual board members, as well as the board as a whole, not be privy to specific information prior to a hearing, right? So, so that's really important. This is a small community as well. So they, I'm sure, are getting communicated all the time, whether it's a stop by and grab a sandwich, hey, did you hear about this? Did you? And, and that's natural. The board has to be very careful not to engage too much to have that. Even when I go through and I have personnel issues, regardless of where these are, I give the board a heads up and say, hey look, there's an issue that took place with a teacher at whatever school that it happens to be, or a staff member. And this is, I'm in the investigation process. Sometimes it will go to these folks, and we go into non-public and deal with those. Sometimes it's handled and resolved at my level. 
they can't get biased information prior to um, having a hearing with either the individual or myself, whether it's a student or whether it's a staff member. So they have to be really careful. And that's why I say they have to do diligence and they have to walk through this process to make it happen. And then the last paragraph I did put in is that I'm always very careful, and I know Gail is, Pam, we are very careful when we're dealing with small populations. And I don't care whether it's uh, test scores of students or whether it's identifying demographics with minorities or special education students. And we have to be just sensitive to that in this community. It's not like there are 400 kids in an elementary school and we say, boy, we're having a trouble with, you know, the, the, the boy population on the playground with the rough housing or whatever it happens to be. So I hope that you can appreciate that. And, and again, the board wants to work with you. I want to work with you. The administration wants to work with the community because we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't want to help improve this process. So I will send this to Susan electronically and, and she can send it out so you can check those links because we want you to be as informed as everybody else because that would help me everything run a little bit smoother. Can I just to add to that too that one thing that we have to do, except for some very you know, uh, specific incidents, we do everything in public. Everything that we do is debated in public, discussed in public. Um, we're not a private board that can talk about things in private and not have to go out into the public. Um, except for very specific issues, everything we do is public. Um, and that's also something that we have to be mindful of when we go through this process of what we do. All right, we have two minutes to close <laughs> this. So I say we just close this. We just go to recess. Recess. recess yeah. Motion to recess. Motion to recess. Okay. So again, we'll be going over the budget, the budget hearing, your documents on the front page here. Let's see what it says. Google, I'll tell you about why we said it. Chair, then you can download it. So um, <laughs> you do have the budget in front of you. We'll start with a, uh, just a, an overview of the budget. Get the good news, bad news out of the way first. The overall budget is up uh, $341,966 over the previous year. That represents a 12.5% increase. There are a number of reasons that are uh, for that, so I will try and walk you through that process. On that first page, it says summary of proposed increases and decreases. So you'll see salaries. What that includes is any um, obligations for increases to current staff members, as well as um, 
also increases to the position. So in this entire budget, you will see that um, there are a couple of changes that did take place. There's an additional one-to-one -one aid that will provide services uh, for IEP, per IEP for students in the school. So that's an additional position in there. Can, can I just stop you for a second? Just so people know, yeah, this is a budget year, regardless of feedback and discussion from the audience. If as we're going through, if you have questions or comments to make, um, you raise your hand and, and we'll get you at the appropriate time to do so. Nope, no problem. Uh, you'll also see a, in this budget, and we can point out the lines as we go through and line by line, uh, a, a 0.4, reading position. Gail, as you folks may or may not know, is retiring at the end of the year. She serves double duty as principal, but she also is a certified reading uh, instruction teacher as well. So we need to provide those services for students. Um, you'll see an increase in the number of hours for after school and enrichment programming. And that went from six hours to 14 hours, so you'll notice that. You'll also see, and in, in this took place last year, and then it morphed, but a combination of library media specialist services and a technology, um, so that is combined into a 1.0 or a full-time position in the budget. So that included with uh, increases in salaries uh, reflects $162,000, which is 60% or more of the total increases to the budget. The health insurance, the health insurance came in at a 9.9% .9 increase. We've also budgeted for, you know, a two-person plan for any vacant positions that we do know that are there. Whether those come in with a single plan or a health waiver, we don't know that, but that's projected budgets for the principal position. Just, Just a quick question, you mentioned about vacancies. How many vacancies do you expect, or how many positions will be open, or you're not sure? To date, right now, we can probably tell you, the, the <laughs> principal, um, we do have one retired teacher, teacher. Yep. Um, and the one-to-one -one aid that will be in for next year, and then the library media specialist position is created for next year. Right now, they're providing some of those services through contracted services, but those are the vacant positions expected moving forward. Thank you. So after the health, and you'll see the FICA retirement in workers' comp. Um, moving forward, you will see uh, the um, travel supplies, the bigger increase that you will see there is contracted services, consultant for special education. Pam Stimson from the SEU 9 can explain what that increase yeah. So that specific increase um, is related to uh, very specialized consultative, ser consultative services that are identified in students' individual education plans. Um, we don't have employees that can provide those services, so we go to outside con consultants. And then you'll see other increased or decreased services, and again, those are dependent upon services that are written into IAPs for individual students. Then down below, you will see middle school tuition. You have agreements with Bartlett for your middle school students, and that drops. You have a decrease of students there. And then you will see the high school tuition. You have an increase in students there. So there are a number of factors that fit into uh, the tuition calculations. It's part average daily membership, part equalized valuation. You will also see that the bond um, principal and in, in interest it has dropped down as well. So overall, that's an increase to your tuition. At the bottom of the page, you'll start to see some of the utilities, contracted services, flip the page, those are minor changes. Um, and you'll see some, some fuel costs. You know, those are projected right now. They haven't locked in just yet, but we're projecting utilities fuel oil at $4.50 a gallon. And then you'll see there were some projects that took place in last year's budget, and that is um, the
those were back down so you don't see as much for contracted services in ground. So overall you see the maintenance costs are up minimally. And then the bottom part, the subtotal others, uh, overall there are some decreases. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention about in the salaries that was included, previously you had contracted out your nursing services and now you have a teaching nurse position part-time in that budget. So that also included. But what you'll notice about halfway down, you'll start to see, um, <coughs> you know, contracted services for the library media is down $11,000. So it's, it's more of a transfer over to the salary position. So in the budget, and I can show you that line by line, same thing with some of the other, the other pieces as well. Um, and overall, the rest are fairly balanced. It looks like there's some new equipment. I think that's the whiteboard, the electronic whiteboard. Yeah. Um, and like our playground, we have some desks and chairs that are quite old, so we're starting a process of updating our student furniture to more up-to-date um, styles and different options like standing desks and things that will upgrade the equipment in the classroom. And then if you flip to the last page, again, continued with the, the maintenance pieces. Uh, again, you both the same thing. So, same thing. Yeah, sorry, I had two of the same. So that's a summary of your increases and decreases. If there are specific questions regarding the lines in the budget, on the left hand side of this document, there are numbers. Okay. And if you have a question about any specific line, I'd be happy to answer those. Or if there are any other pieces that Gail you want to make note of, you can refer to those, those lines. But generally, those are the ups and downs in this budget. Do you have a question, Ann? Yeah. Yes. I'm not, one of my questions is when you want to entertain questions specific to the line. So Kevin's reference to the $11,000 reduction uh, by the media. Am I understanding where is that money? Is that money the same thing to the Jackson Public Library? Where is that $11,000 coming from? Where is it going? You probably yes. can't explain this, I just so, we, yes, part of that is going currently to the Jackson Public Library, and another part of that is going to um, the a media specialist from Conway Elementary, who is serving as our certified library media person, which is required under the school approval standards. So she's been consulting with our staff and with the library to be sure we're covering all the bases with the competencies. Great. So that's both of those um, positions. Can I have a follow up? Um, the person who is currently your uh, technology facilitator, mm -hmm. is that still held in this budget? You will have both the technology facilitator and. Uh, no, no, that, that would be that away. would be combined. Yes. So that you would be hiring uh, someone hypothetically with an MLS who might or might not have the skill sets who a technology facilitator is providing to your school. How is one person with an element going to have a, relationship, a successful relationship, in my view, with the Jackson Public Library currently, who just hired a new library director, who of course has a very strong educational background, and I personally think that there is great value <coughs> community-wide for us to continue our relationship with the Jackson Public Library. That's just my personal opinion. I know that from a budgeting perspective, you would not necessarily know that that lady was the individual who was going no, to be. No, did not. Yeah, right? Yeah. And that you have to do, when you're developing your budget months ago, I would just ask the board to entertain moving forward the concept of continuing a strong relationship with the Jackson Public Library, particularly with the development of the new 
director who has been hired who I think could provide very valuable services. And I know this is not a surprise to you because I said it last year, hiring a full-time library media person for our school <coughs> who already have very limited instructional space and space for another full-time employee when possibly you could have a more um, diversified approach to that, I think is really worth re-examining. Not only would it be more cost-effective, but if we're thinking about <coughs> education as a community-wide effort, I think continuing, continuing to use the Jackson Public Library in a holistic way is really worth considering. So I think that covers it for now. Somebody should have to you want to take that on? So yeah, we plan to continue to have a strong relationship with the Jackson Library that's never been off the table. I mean, that's something that we always plan to do. Um, and we realize it's a long shot to find someone that can fill both roles for one position. Um, and um, it's the most creative way we can come up with we can combine two elements into one. If we can find it, it would solve many of our problems for the library media specialist and um, for uh, the, um, the tech person. Um, we probably won't find someone there. Um, but if we still had the funds there, then we'd still be able to perhaps contract that service out, um, still work with the Jackson Library as much as we can. Um, the new information from there is certainly helpful. Um, we'll certainly pursue that information. Um, but um, it's, again, it's, we have to be creative in how we fill the positions that we're, that we're missing. This is a problem that the entire nation is facing. Um, and this is just one way that we're trying to tackle this one problem. Um, if it works, it would actually work out very well for us. Um, if it doesn't, then we will go back to plan B and plan C and plan D and, and face reality as it, as it hits us. Um, but this is just another tool to have in our bag to fill the positions that we need to fill. Um, and um, that, that tech coordinated position in the library media specialist position <coughs> would blend very well together for how they're utilizing the classroom in today's classroom environment. Um, that's what we're hearing from our staff and that's what we're seeing um, you know, from from what we're seeing, from what we need for our school. Um, and that's the reason why we put it in there that way. Um, to follow up on the question, um, this year you have a contract with, uh, with the library uh, for a certain amount, and so this budget assumes that you do not have a contract with the library for that amount. Uh, I think it's $7,500, if I recall correctly. Um, it, it, and so when, and then you coordinated with the library to make sure their budgeting for their salaries is going to be less $7,500 if you're approaching it this way? If you refer to line 140 on the left hand side, you'll see a section there that talks about improvement of instruction. So this is how things were budgeted and how things changed. So you'll see there is a pretty significant increase in what you'll see is on that top line, 140, right? So it says, for last year, under FY23, 16,500. And then this year, you see zero. And then the line below it says, salary for the tech library media specialist was zero. And now it's $54,000. So basically, the, the board discussed along with the principal, trying to fill these part-time positions is extremely difficult. And, um, and they're, they're critical positions to the, to the school. The Jackson Library has done a nice job of partnering with the school district, but it's, it's not the same, you know, having somebody right in the building. So they've kind of gone back and forth to say, okay, let's try again get a quality person in there, but remember when you pay salary full time, there are also the benefits that go with that. So that's why it is, is can be more expensive in some cases. In some cases it may be cheaper depending upon which services that you're looking for. Um, so that money is in the budget and then the board would authorize the, in working with the principal, this is the best plan moving forward. We find a great person that, that is Cracker Jack that happens to be a library media specialist, a reading specialist, a technology <laughs> coordinator. That'd be great. We can combine that person, keep him forever. Um, 
but we may have to break that out, which was the case this year, that we didn't have um, a library media specialist that wanted a part-time job. The technology position didn't get filled until after the school year started. And so they're just trying to be creative to, to get the services in for the students. Susan, um, could you address a little bit about what the library media specialist does compared to what's happened in the, um, what the, the kind of good things are doing at the library now, but how that reflects back to the classroom? Right, I think um, as far as the literature, exposure to literature, the Jackson Public Library has done a wonderful job and Meredith works very closely with our teachers and uh, I know there's a great love of having the kids in that building. The other parts that come along with the library media job are teaching kids how to do research and citations, how to be safe online, digital citizenship, uh, research strategies, compositions, and working very closely with staff in providing them with resources and databases that are safe and vetted for children's uses. So it goes beyond the books, and that's why we've paid another uh, media specialist to come in and consult, because there's a, if you look on the um, Department of Education website for the competencies, there are pages and pages and pages <coughs> of standards and competencies that need to be taught through a school's library media program. So we, we haven't been able to get all of that from the Jackson Public Library, so we've had to supplement in order to do that. So, you know, having um, the person in the building to be able to meet with the teachers face to face and see what the kids are doing or be in the classrooms and working on our Chromebooks within the classroom units is really ideal. Um, you know, what Ian said is true, having it be Meg Murphy, who is the consultant that's been working with us, um, does change it up a little bit because she has that knowledge and that background. But we'll see, as Kevin said, and I think what Jerry was getting at, whatever seems best for our students is the way that we should go to ensure that they get all the services that they need. And then in that case, we can always, the board can always approve moving sums of money into a different line to accommodate whichever um, seems to be the best approach. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, projected student census over the next five years. I don't know. Approximately. That's it. Uh, we have sent that to the essay for the book. I don't have it right in front of me now, right now. Uh, we're missing it out. Oh. Four or five. Uh, Here we go. Total number of students. Yeah. Do you yeah. probably did this with it? Yeah. I did. I found two kinder kindergartners since I sent it. Okay, so 22, 23, 48 students, 23, 24, 44, 24, 25, 42. And then you said there are two more? Um, for next year, and then a bunch got added at the end. Okay. Yeah. One's a little second and third grader. Yeah, and then, yeah, some incoming second So hovering in the, in the mid 40s. Yeah. So we've been after a while. Again, this will be a summative statement. I totally respect and understand the budget process. I also understand the difference between what uh, literature-based program that the library offers versus what a library media person does in our building versus what a technology coordinator and the services that provide, which are fundamentally different than some of the MLS. I just would say, and again, that you need to have a placeholder in your budget in order to fulfill both the mandate for library media specialists and the curriculum around that support for the teaching staff. I continue to feel that hiring a full-time library media person for our building for the student population in the mid-40s, as well as the number of staff that we have currently providing services for our students 
is excessive. That is just my personal view, having held some of those responsibilities myself. <coughs> Again, it's not a surprise. I'm just restating for the record. And um, would also say that I really appreciate the effort that you put into the budgeting process. This is not a personal reflection on the effort of the work that you're doing. I just personally think it's too much. Thank you, I understand that. I, yeah. I don't know if I heard you wrong, because I can't see that far anymore, so I can't hear that far. Um, so the, the media specialist is not full-time. <coughs> is that what you said, was a full-time media specialist? You were hiring a full-time media specialist slash technology person. Yes, so I, yeah, so I thought you said just the media specialist. Yes. So I just want to make sure so that we're seeing that. Dan said she'd come back from <laughs> using right. the library. A fourth-fifths, a fourth-fifths, one-fifth, I mean, how do you? I, I don't know how it would play out in the classroom. 50, 50, 60, 40. I mean, I think it, would be, it could roll back and forth depending on the needs of the moment. Yeah. As you know, preliminary. I just want to hear what Kevin. Okay. Uh, we're talking, in, in, as I said, is it 50 50 or 60 40? Gail's saying pretty much 60% library media specialist, 40% technology responsibility. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. And back to what Kevin said before about the ability to hire part time staff has become nearly impossible. So we could separate the two and have, you know, the um, I don't know what a 60-40 split is as far as hours, but let's say it's a 50% position from library media specialist and a 30% position for technology. Um, we could put that out there, and the budget numbers probably wouldn't change that much with what we're looking at right now. Um, they might come down a little bit because of benefits, but not that much. So we're combining the two into one position. Again, it's a long shot. We, we don't really expect to be able to find that person, but if we do, it would really fill the needs of our school very well. Well, I think furthermore, it's, I mean, let's just tone down the long shot for a moment because <laughs> I think what we're talking about is that this is feedback that we've seen for the past two years trying to fill this position and seeing that actually this full-time position has legs and that would give us more flexibility and the ability to really hire those people versus saying, hey, this is, this is something we don't think is going to happen. This is how we think we can solve this need. I think that's like... I mean, our board has been around and around on it. I've talked to the community about this last year and looking at the current array. So this is, you know, this is strategically speaking what we really feel needs to happen to meet the needs and a really emerging and continually changing field where our students really need that level of support both across tech and library. Thanks, it's a much better way to put that. <laughs> I want to be too much What's the status of the tuition agreement with the uh, high school? So um, they have Jackson had the, there's a three year opt out clause that doesn't come into play for Jackson for the high school until June of 2024. So you have another year to make a decision to opt out or not. If it goes silent, then it just adds one more year to the existing contract with Conway for high school students. So does that mean that June of 2024, Jackson School Board sends a notification to Conway to say, hey, we're opting out? <coughs> they could. They could say, well, we're going to continue to negotiate, see what our options are. There is a lot of work that is being done by uh, Darlene Ferentz in the committee, and I think the, the lots of minutes and notes and, and uh, conversations that are taking place. But right now, Jackson has one more year to make some decisions and continue negotiation process. And is, is the um, joint maintenance agreement still under consideration, or is that done? It, it's done. Yep. More questions, the better. Anybody else? Love them now. <laughs> Your friends have any questions? <coughs> yeah, I'm gonna throw something out. I want to ask Gail. Um, you know, to Anne's point about a school with our 
you know, the number of students we have and kind of capacity and space, what is your take from teachers and staff in the building about having another, like a full-time person, like a library media, one person holding that role versus having, you know, a media specialist and a library person coming in and out? I just, could you speak to that? It's too bad my teachers left, because I'm sure they oh, would yeah. have something to say. But, um, you know, obviously, for convenience and providing planning time and being part of staff meetings when we're making decisions about curriculum, uh, being able to come into the classroom and teach lessons on digital citizenship without schlepping computers back and forth or making arrangements for three weeks down the um, you know, hall. The one thing we continue to have trouble with uh, is space. Um, it is true what Ann said, it's a small building and finding spaces and office space for everyone to work in. We play some days when we have some of those um, consultants in the building, we're all playing musical offices. Um, so that is, that is truly a need. But the, co the convenience and time, you know, without having to spend lots of time after school or use electronic correspondence and Zooming and, and those kinds of things, it just adds another layer of, of uh, complication to collaboration than being in the same building. Yeah. Makes so it, drops it facilitates it a lot. It's actually one person instead of two people. That's true too. It's kind the of number of part-time people as a principal um, they can't all make it to the staff meetings on the same days and they're, you know, not around for certain things and you think you've talked to everybody and you've always missed somebody trying to make sure everybody gets all the memos and, and things of that nature. So it is, it is difficult to workshop, teacher workshop days, people have other jobs and other commitments. So it does provide some unique challenges having a whole building full of part-time folks. Okay, I'm going to move on to reading the Warren articles. You should. Well, don't vote, but then. Uh, article one to see if the school district will vote to raise the appropriate for some of $3,104,417 for the support of schools, for the payment of salaries for school district officials and agents, and for the payment of statutory obligations of the district with. 21,812 offsetting this amount for various grants. This article does not include appropriations voted in other warrant articles. So just so for clarification there, um, that's the operating budget that we just went through the discussion on. So that three million and change is, is, is everything we've just talked about. So if there's any, if there's any more questions about that or comments. Okay, article two is going to be to see if the school district will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of 25000 to the to be added to the capital reserve fund, special education, previously established for this purpose. And um, what is the total of the fund currently? The balance in? $210,161. We're trying to get it to two fifty. dollars Okay. That seems to be what the, the standard for this school would be. I mean, that's so that the taxes don't get impacted severely in one year or we don't have to spend uh, deficit spending in one year. Article 3, to see if the school district will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of 3000 to be added to the Whitney Maintenance Trust Fund previously established for this purpose in 2010. Questions? And there's currently $52,000 in that account. Thank you. I think Article we're also contracting <coughs> obliged to put money in. Here. Article 4, to see if the school district will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of 75000 for the purpose of the design, purchase, and installation of the playground equipment. This appropriation is in addition to the warrant article number 1 of the operating okay. Any questions on 4? Do we need to re vote on these, but we only have four members vote? Well, they're fine. They're last. I wasn't here last. Michael wasn't here. Oh, well, we need to vote on these after the public hearing. Yeah. But, so the numbers that are there now actually don't count. They don't count until after. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So so the way that, that process works from our standpoint is we, you know, we put it up in the last meeting because it is what we're going to do for this meeting. We hold the meeting, get feedback from the public. And then once we've heard that feedback, then we formulate our opinions as to whether we support 
or not more than not. That's the process that, that we do. Right. Any questions? <laughs> several occasions. She's a former employee of the Bartlett School. Um, she's going to be coming on March 7th at 5.30 and talk about phases of child development, parenting choices based on the age and stages of your children, um, allowing children to make mistakes and why that's crucial, and talk about expectations for behavior in elementary school students. Um, the PTO is going to be offering babysitting, so contact Victoria if you would like to um, RSVP and reserve some child care spots. Thank you, thank you very much. So I don't know if anybody knows Vicki Garland, but she did a presentation when um, my child was 
probably in the sixth or seventh grade on trans or sixth grade transitioning over what to expect. And I'd like to say it was very successful. My child is still alive because of this presentation that we went to. It's, it's extremely interesting to take what you might think you know about children and their brain development and their behaviors and actually hear it from a professional. And I'd highly recommend that you attend this, even if you are in a blissfully happy home right now and you have no questions. It's very encouraging to go. You'll be amazed at what you learn. Thank you for putting it together. Anything else, Kelly? Yes, um, we've just had a really uh, busy few weeks. Our fifth and sixth graders participated in the Mock Newberry Awards with their counterparts over in Bartlett. They read some new young adult fictional books, talk amongst the other young adults, and um, rank the books and pick ones that they then collaborate virtually with some students from New York to select what they would award the Newbury Award to. So um, that's what they've been up to. Um, we're having great success with New Hampshire adaptive sports up at the mountain. Um, it's really uh, inspirational to see their work with some of our needy kids. Um, they're really doing a great job. So if we ever had some skiing and the weather and snow <laughs> on Fridays. We haven't skied quite as much as we would like, but uh, it's all underway and going well. Our two, three, you'll see the dragon heads behind you. They did a dragon dance this morning for our all school meeting, sang a song for the Lunar uh, New Year, spoke in French about it a little bit, so it was a good compilation of our um, thematic unit in the second and third grade. And then the fourth grade took a bus down to Kennett High and got to spend time watching the concert band, the jazz band, and the drum line, and they all came back really jazzed. I had announced earlier this year, we have the entire fourth grade class, all 13 students, taking an instrument this year, so um, Lauren's done a nice job with them and felt like seeing the high school musicians would be inspirational and, and it truly was. It was a great um, experience. So, And you will note, I don't have the exact date, but there's a drumline show coming up. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Let's go to the drumline. Tomorrow, Saturday, and then next weekend also. It's well heated. Kevin the auditorium. It was Kevin awesome. Kevin went to the performance with us. It's amazing. I highly recommend that everyone go out. It's for all ages. <laughs> I was blown away when I went in one year. It's amazing and it's different every year. Mm -hmm. yep. And the kids write some of the songs themselves. So yeah. Sorry, you just you have to see it. It's <laughs> yeah. spectacular. For sure. And then my final thing is um, I would love to invite one of the board members to uh, be on the playground committee as I trying to reminding the committee I'm getting the ball rolling but won't be there for the long run. <laughs> So if I could get a board member to join that committee um, in the role of chair would be nice to keep that committee moving forward. Um, Jerry, I think if you help install the playground, <laughs> you <laughs> have a playground committee. It's like a, it's a universal. No. no. Yeah. 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 It's part of the deal. It's like, like turning my side. You, oh no, uh -huh. I, got, I spoke up fast. So yeah, <laughs> you like laid hands and actually like put the playground together. <laughs> You can take your swing set home with you. Can we figure it out after the lecture? You table that till next week? Yeah. Oh, your court. Thanks. Okay. So it's Jerry. Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Nice job. Thank you. Anything else? No, I'm good. Then you're good. Okay. All right. All right. Board member issues. We're going to the committee reports. Policy committee is meeting Monday. We had another meeting from last meeting. Personnel committee? You did, there have been yeah. some in the back. The personnel committee? Yes. <coughs> um, facilities and transportation committee? Anything? All right, the high school options committee? Darlene? Yeah, nothing new in the last you know, two weeks. We just trading information, uh, continuing to gather information. Can we have enough people on the committee right now? That feels... No, I, no. So, so you're looking for more people to be on the committee? Uh, no. We've not really at this point in time. Okay. We have to kind of see where our direction is because a lot of the things that we you know, have done, mm -hmm. we're really not sure about. So 
going forward, how many more people will need, but that, you know, might need one person to do something. We'll, we'll reach out. Okay. Um, DEI? Yeah, in the um, board packet, we want, I want to make a motion to approve the contract um, that we put forward with New Hampshire Listens to move forward with them um, to consult and work on what we presented to the board earlier. And that's what you decided to go with? Yeah, yeah, we're well, really excited about it. And we've, we've split it into two parts um, to kind of to facilitate a transition. So we'll do two workshopping services with the staff this spring. And then over the summer, they'll come in and work towards the end of the summer with the, any new hires and the new principal to get them up to speed. And then provide another um, couple of workshops into next year, and then from that point on, the committee will continue to assess what the needs are and, and to move. And the forward. board will also go through, right? So yes. Okay, we're okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. Make a motion. Oh, I'll make a motion. Oh. <laughs> Can I second the motion? Sure. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Right. Thank you for doing the work. Who seconded that? I seconded it. Thanks, Mom. Safety committee. So, uh, nothing really new at this point in time. Continuing uh, to follow all the processes and procedures at the school. Nothing uh, out of the ordinary. Can get people. To. Um, Whitney Center. Um, you know, we reported the last meeting that we had. So at this point, the Whitney Center is continuing the programming. We we'll see a lot more. Advertising, they're trying to get a variety of uh, events here scheduled in the building and uh, you know, try to really get out to the community. All right, strategic plan? Nothing. No updates? Nope. Just so you know, the um, town facilities meeting that we presented to Barbara Campbell and I, and we presented to the selectmen, the select folks last week, two weeks ago. Um, overall, it was uh, the information that was shared and Bill was there, I think, um, was positive. So we've handed off the findings to the select people. Um, they are now obligated to put it on their agenda as we do ours under old business to make sure that they are held accountable for certain things that are on that. Um, I am positive, I have a positive feeling that we'll see some, some action from them uh, moving forward. So. So that is a wrap. We're done with that. Do you have any good comment on that? Um, we're not citizen comments, but okay, Bill, because you are on the committee with me. Yeah, just, just very quickly, I, I, I think the, uh, there are pieces that I do refer to that each of the various, your shop and, and theirs need to address and, and, and probably look at. Uh, but one of the things that uh, and, and it concerns me because they are talking about doing a, a capital improvement plan mm -hmm. uh, in, in the coming year. And if that does come to fruition, that will end up being a planning board, which I share. And uh, my concern about that is, is that we coordinate properly with you guys on that so that when we're looking at it, we're not just looking at it from uh, the town funding perspective. I think one of the issues we had as part of the committee was the clash between needs for capital <coughs> in the school system as well as in the town and not blending those two well. And I, I would like to, if I can possibly, I'm not sure if we could do it, but if it's at all possible, I'd like to make sure that we take into consideration your needs as well as the town needs when we're taking a look at some of that stuff because it ends up all being from the same tax base. Right. So, yeah, and we will continue to work together when you're ready to start, you know, once the select people. I'll need your help. Right. <laughs> then we'll be back here again, and, and I think that that was the whole goal, is that we all work together as a unified community as to what our what our needs are from a community perspective and how do we go about accomplishing that. I'll need your help. And, yeah. And thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for bringing that up. And let's, let's keep our eye on the wall and make that happen. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, sorry, we need to. Um, we do need to vote on more of this, and let's do it now. So I make a motion um, in favor of uh, Article One. Second. 
Thank you. Thank you.